So as we all know that the coronavirus pandemic has impacted us tremendously, particularly in terms of the gender inequity that has broadened or increased much compared to past time, specifically the these all gender inequality equalities or gender inequities have contributed to increased amount of stress, which has ultimately impacted the work-life balance of women because now women are women have reduced their working hours. Many of them have actually left the labor force. What is very much different from the experience of the male partners who are still working with little adjustment to the household related works. We also found that the research on black feminism and indigenous feminism unveiled the existence of patriarchy that has demonstrated that the black indigenous and women of, uh, and the people of color women have experienced greater gendered division of domestic labor at their household. So of course, what we expect is that because of the cultural differences among the BIPOC women, they may have a different gender role expectations compared to the non-BIPOC women, which has influenced in their domestic division of labor. So what we do not know is that what is the experience of these BIPOC women in terms of their work-life balance. While we were actually looking into the existing literature of work-life balance, we found that culture plays a very important role in shaping or determining the work-life balance. So therefore we expect that the BIPOC women would have a very unique work-life experience because of their different cultural expectations or the different set of cultural value orientation compared to the non bipoc counterparts. However, there are a very little amount of research which has considered the variance in work-life balance based on these intersectional experiences of the BIPOC women. While we were looking into the extent literature, we have also found that women of color experience reduced work-life balance, not only compared to the men, but also compared to the white women who are actually playing the, the role of their counterparts. And what happened is that emotion plays a very important role in determining the division of domestic labor and also the work-life balance. We found in the current literature that the perceived inequity of domestic labor of uh, particularly uh, if the inequity exists in terms of the domestic division of labor, that leads to negative emotions. But if there is equity, in that case, women experience positive emotions. However, past research has neither theorized work-life balance as emotional responses that may derive from the inequity in division of labor, nor it has explained the work-life balance within the framework of cultural value orientation. So therefore, these are our specific research questions. So we like, would like to investigate, sorry. So we'd like to investigate that how do the cultural value orientations of BIPOC women influence their work-life balance through the division of domestic labor, which means that the division of domestic labor here plays the role of mediator. And we also want to see that what is the role of emotion in shaping work-life balance originated from domestic division of labor and cultural values. So our specific research objectives are that we, we are actually developing this conceptual paper to propose a theoretical model to address the influence of cultural value orientation on BIPOC women's work-life balance through the mediation of domestic division of labor. So we have applied various theories in this conceptual paper, particularly we have relied on the cultural value orientations theory, social role theory, and social interactional theory of emotions to investigate our relationships. Before moving to the theoretical framework, I would like to walk you through a little bit of literature review, specifically what we found in terms of work-life balance, emotion, and the experience of BIPOC women. As we can see from the definition of work-life balance, that it's an, it's an outcome of the effective experiences which are experienced by individuals in terms of the work and non-work roles. In fact, 
the effectiveness of work-life balance actually depends on the effective balance between positive and negative emotions that can arise from work and non-work roles. What we also found is that the ethnic minority women often deal with different types of cultural community or religious demands, which may further impact their unique work-life experiences. What we found is that the domestic division of labor here plays a very important role in determining the work-life balance. And of course, the domestic division of the labor is determined by the gender roles. So as we all know that the gender roles are actually determined through our childhood experiences when we grew up through different experiences surrounded by our family, our friends and the society. So as part of the traditional gender roles, women are often, often expected to be more communal, whereas men are expected to be more agentic, which actually determines or shapes the idea of domestic division of labor, where women are socially expected to take on the major part of the domestic division of labor. At the same time, we have also found that culture plays a very important role in terms of determining the domestic division of labor and also work-life balance in the sense that the cultures or the countries which are more or more uh, gender traditional oriented or which have higher amount of gender egalitarianism that actually determines how the domestic work will be divided or distributed among men and women. For example, there are some Northern countries in the Europe which are more egalitarian compared to the Asian countries which actually focus on greater equity in the division of household work. Similarly, in case of work-life balance, culture has also played a very important role, but unfortunately in the literature, the, the construct work-life balance has been defined as a Western construct, which have actually ignored the, the idea of, of the cross-cultural impact on work-life balance. So therefore, we are particularly interested to look into how the culture can shape the domestic division of labor and also the work-life balance. So which will be continued by my colleague, Tina, in form of the theoretical framework and the propositions. Thank you. Tina, we can't hear you, Tina. Now, sorry about that. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, Tina, now it's okay. okay. Sorry about that. So uh, basically we considered uh, Schwartz's cultural value orientation framework, which proposes seven types of values based on which cultures can be compared. Uh, and in essence, values represent ideas of what's right versus wrong within various societal contexts. Next slide, please. So first we examined hierarchy versus egalitarian orientations as they pertain to division of domestic labor. So cultures with firmly established hierarchies tend to exhibit higher power distance and lower gender egalitarianism. And that's because gender roles tend to be more pronounced um, in countries that have yet that unequal distribution of power. Uh, and so egalitarian cultures actually promote gender equality, which then can be further reflected in domestic division of labor. And so therefore hierarchical uh, cultures with greater power distance will oftentimes demonstrate more unequal division of domestic labor, um, which is more prominent. So our first proposition is that BIPOC women with egalitarian cultural values will tend to ex experience higher equity and division of domestic labor. And alternatively, BIPOC women with hierarchical cultural values will experience lower equity and division of domestic labor. Next, we looked at embeddedness versus autonomy orientation. So embeddedness is very much like collectivism. It really emphasizes obedience, meeting obligations, this kind of uh, stronghold towards tradition. Uh, in contrast, autonomy orientations really just emphasize individualism, this idea of creativity, uh, freedom, and so within autonomous cultures, we tend to see men and women perform household work more equally, 
given, again, those greater liberal attitudes towards gender roles, whereas in embedded cultures, women may face pressure to participate in those household responsibilities alongside other care, uh, caregiving activities because they feel they need to fulfill their obligations towards greater collectivism and also more salient gender roles are, are prescribed in those uh, types of cultures. Um, so there's more responsiveness to in-group members like partners and family members. Uh, therefore, we propose that BIPOC women with autonomy-oriented cultural values will exhibit higher equity in division of domestic labor. On the other hand, BIPOC women with embedded uh, oriented cultures will experience lower equity in division of domestic labor. Uh, and then we looked at mastery and harmony orientations. So within mastery oriented cultures, uh, basically there's greater control and exploitation of world resources and the natural order. And that's really meant to further self-interest. In contrast, we see harmony orientation cultures really resisting the change in natural of order and really just adapting to it. So uh, this combined with traditional gender roles means that um, we can expect that in harmony orientation cultures, it creates increased pressure for BIPOC women to maintain and nurture those caregiving and household responsibilities. Uh, alternatively, in mastery cultures, women may act ambitious and daring and more autonomous and then try to fulfill their own goals, uh, which might create less opportunity to actually engage in those traditional gender roles, such as domestic uh, division of labor. Uh, therefore, we propose uh, that BIPOC women with mastery-oriented cultural values will perceive higher equity in division of domestic labor, uh, and BIPOC women with harmony-oriented cultural values will perceive lower equity in division of domestic labor. And so if we look at as a, emotion as a mediator for the relationship between division of domestic labor and work-life balance, we see that perceived equity or inequity of division of domestic labor can actually uh, trigger positive or ne negative affect or emotion amongst women. So according to social interactional theory of emotion, uh, emotions come up uh, due to perceived injustices that take place along two uh, interactional axes, which are power and status. Uh, women are likely to experience greater anger alongside more negative feelings when uh, they're conducting more household work compared to men, um, given their reduced perceived uh, power status. And they also might find themselves in lower status positions within family and home domains as well, which causes that negative affect. In contrast, uh, women are expected to experience various positive emotions, including joy, happiness overall, uh, when household work is equally distributed again, uh, amongst men and women, um, because again, there's perceptions of higher pow uh, power status for women. Therefore, we predict that BIPOC women will exhibit positive emotions when they perceive greater equity in their division of domestic labor, and in turn, uh, alternatively, BIPOC women will exhibit negative emotions when they perceive lower equity in a division of domestic labor. And as well, uh, if we look at positive emotions, uh, we can see that if they broaden an individual's awareness and scope of attention, they also uh, provide an upward spiral towards better and more enhanced well-being. Uh, positive emotions uh, were also found to be very negatively related to work-family conflict, but positively related to work-family facilitation. Again, we look at, in contrast, negative emotions have implications for individual strain, um, reduced well-being, and it's responsible for development of negative attitudes and other behaviors. Um, and this is kind of understood through spillover theory, which, which suggests that negative experiences from one domain can be carried over or transferred to another domain, which can cause conflict between work and non-work domains. Therefore, finally, we propose that BIPOC women who exhibit positive emotions will experience higher work-life balance. Uh, BIPOC women who exhibit negative emotions will experience lower work-life balance. And finally, BIPOC women's positive and negative emotions will mediate the relationship between perceived equity uh, in division of domestic labor and work-life balance. And we uh, also demonstrate our proposed research model. So as you can see, the cultural values that uh, I mentioned before, hierarchy versus egalitarianism, et cetera, uh, impact the equity and division of domestic labor for BIPOC women, which can in turn either create positive or negative emotions, which uh, essentially impact their work-life balance.
So a few implications for theory and practice, utilizing these various uh, theories that we mentioned, uh, this research provides a more comprehensive examination of the very broad experiences of women in the labor force, also provides discourse on the effective consequences of things like gender identity, race, cultural values, and how they can really impact work-life balance for women in the labor force. Also highlights intersectionality when we're studying um, you know, women's experiences within management research, provides unique insights for organizations on how to effectively facilitate and support their diverse workforce, uh, which can help build policies and practices to, again, more broadly uh, support uh, individuals from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, and finally, uh, really, this intersectional consideration provides insight into the interplay between work and home environment, which is crucial, we think, for uh, BIPOC women's progress within work and society. Um, so that pretty much wraps up our presentation. Uh, we leave it open for questions. So thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I can already hear the questions churning in people's minds um, for the Q&A that's going to come. Um, next up, we will have um, right here, sorry, one second. Well, I was so caught up by the presentation that I didn't uh, pull up my uh, moderator's script. So I think next up we have the, uh, here. We have Shahab. And um, Shahab, if you could introduce yourself, that would be good. Sure. Thank you, Monsieur. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Shahab Bayani. I'm a PhD candidate in the Faculty of Humanities here at York University. Um, the title of my paper is The Summer of Quiet Skies, A Humanities Perspective on Aerospace Professionals. I'd like to share a window to my current research where I study the underlying causes of the skilled labor shortage in the Canadian aerospace industry. Simply put, we are running short of airline pilots and mechanics needed for our future air travel needs. I approach this problematic from a humanities and cultural studies perspective. My advocacy for homegrown STEM careers takes into account opinions from the high skilled technology workers themselves. The aircraft maintenance engineers or AMEs, colloquially referred to as aircraft mechanics and secondly, commercial airline pilots, each voicing their own unique encounters surrounding job satisfaction and job security. While this project is a work in progress, I would like to scrutinize some of the current national policy considerations that are focused on making the industry more resilient and making these specific roles attractive again as a career choice. Here's a bit of a background. My own professional career in commercial aviation began in 1985, less than 10 years after immigrating to Canada. I'm still invested in the sector and study the labor challenges it encounters during high and low demand periods. It might seem counterintuitive, but these professionals experience multiple layoffs in their career span since the sector is linked to the broader economy, resulting in high cyclicality. The relevance of personal experience helps my understanding of the work setting and the diverse subject positions. Regardless of the historic realities in aviation labor composition, including male domination, Global labor mobilities have altered the traditionally homogenous identities of aviators. As well, 21st century praxis of gender, race, and ethnicity have also pushed back against outdated stereotypes in technology work. Today, many of our own aviation professionals are skilled immigrants or the children of the same, with an increasing number of professional women as well policy efforts are underway to intensify indigenous inclusion. On the basis of growing universal need for safe air travel, no other profession might bring the volume of diverse groups physically together as much as aviation does. Over time, the industry has matured enough to tap into diverse talent 
from those that meet the required standards. Unfortunately, considering the sum of attrition from retirement, career exiting, and talent competition with other more stable technology sectors, supply has not kept up. Despite disruptions to family life, some opt to work abroad for airlines that provide better remuneration and training packages. This reaffirms global competition for the skill set of the professionals who are passionate about their work, yet endure the hidden burden of emotional stresses induced at work. Furthermore, questions of personal identity, social prestige, and the differentiation of manual and intellectual labor have an enormous impact on the self-conceptualization of workers. A formal understanding of gender inequality, as well as an understanding of marginalization, identity, and masculinity constructions that are inherent in the labor relations, but might not be verbally articulated, but rather appear in coded form, requires a mode of analysis that goes beyond economic and sociological analysis. The disruptions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic has been a shock to both employers and employees, triggering a revolutionary reset moment. Naturally, workers are evaluating their own long-term job security. The consensus on the aerospace workers' shortage dilemma is that the shortage was already a concern prior to the pandemic. The heavy impact of the pandemic on the industry created unprecedented operational contractions of up to 90%. Although federal support was made available to impacted workers, the unexpected vulnerability triggered many professionals to reevaluate their career progression prospects. Some exercised an early retirement option or switched careers where possible. For those that had questioned their career choice already, the disruption provided a final motive to leave. This domestic hollowing out of the aviation sector is anticlimactic to Canada's national growth ambitions and the STEM mantra. Diverse groups in the industry value mentorship and representation in professional roles that they aspire to fill. Not to mention the great sense of trust based on camaraderie that is shared and cherished among seasoned aerospace workers. In general, the reality of wage stagnation relative to the rising cost of housing offers no distinction or exemption between essential and non-essential workers. One might argue that the workers most passionate about starting careers in this sector are either economically squeezed out or faced great difficulty in life work balancing. For example, the long daily commutes to the airport triggers gradual burnout. Whether this work-based burnout is manifested through exhaustion, cynicism, or diminished professional efficacy, the end result is not favorable to the skill supply challenge. It follows that parked aircraft and furloughed employees were the unseen component contributing to the title I signed for this talk, the summer of quiet skies. On my approach and methodology, in the academic inquiry, I triangulate a path between the workers, the corporate perspective, and the academy for the important role it can play in enhancing the future workplace. Over the last year, in my field research, I had the privilege of talking with a diverse range of commercial aviation professionals across Canada, men and women at different career stages shared their views by contributing to a qualitative questionnaire. This group insight informs my self-reflective observations to establish an objective work-based epistemology of the sector. As the corporate side navigates through regulatory obligations, restructuring against competition and meeting consumer demands, it might seem that core labor concerns are left to management, supervisors, and unions perhaps an outdated less affair construct that in itself has either exacerbated or failed to resolve the labor supply predicament. In examining the efficacy of labor concerns and the managerial outlook on skilled labor, 
I aim to address the first two of four hypotheses. First, are profit-driven managerial approaches diminishing the desirability of aviation careers? And second, what do differences in subject, excuse me, what do differences in job satisfaction among dominant and subaltern labor reveal? <clears throat> excuse me, reveal. So how might this all come together toward a solution? Aerospace Industries Association of Canada, AIAC, is the leading national association and partner of choice with the Canadian government. As a unified voice for aerospace, their think tank efforts are positioned to positively alter the sector's future. One key area being safeguards against the labor shortage. Their activism for relying on skilled immigrant labor is part of my inquiry in the third hypothesis. That is, how can resilience to future air travel restrictions minimize precarity for aviation professionals? Lastly, the academy plays a central role in preparing the nation's future workforce and the very leaders that employees look up to for direction. The academy has accumulated vast knowledge with diversity in the contemporary world and holds a successful track record in educating diverse groups. For this reason, I examine the fourth hypothesis through the lens of available scholarship to interpret my collected data. That is, with the current understanding of gender, race, and ethnicity, in equitable economic advancement, are aviation managers alleviating the shortages? What is missing? So in our discussion, I would like to share some of the gaps in the proposed solutions relative to the voice, voice and experiences of labor. Thank you. Okay, that was, that was um, wonderful. And it's great to, it's great to see um, you, as Prof. Luan mentioned, it's great to see you approaching this topic and people studying this topic um, based in their own context. So um, thank you for your insights. And that was a wonderful topic to hear about and slightly different, but still relevant. Um, now we have time to go to Linda. Um, Linda, are you ready here? Yes, thank you, I'm ready. Uh, may I share the screen? Yes, go ahead. Brent will give you the capability to share the screen. Okay. Do you have the capability here? Okay, go ahead. Um, if you could introduce yourself and then start with yeah. the presentation. Yes, 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 of course, thank you. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for giving this opportunity to participate in this conference. My name is Linda Vatsgaila. Um, I'm coming from, I, I, I'm from the European University Institute. It's uh, situated in Florence in Italy. And uh, I am a PhD student. Uh, at the four, at, at, and I'm in my final year of my four year PhD program. And so today I'm going to present you uh, the paper on which I'm working uh, on currently, uh, Effects of Postponing Fatherhood on Wages, a comparison of West, uh, of West Germany and the United Kingdom. And so to start with, um, uh, prior research has shown that uh, on average, men, uh, when they become fathers, uh, they tend to earn higher wages than um, childless men, all else equal. Uh, however, um, when we look at uh, um, wage dynamics uh, uh, between women, when women become uh, mothers, uh, the opposite process happens. Uh, they tend to have lower wages compared to childless women, all else equal. And it is the so-called wage penalty. However, there is uh, the evidence in the prior research showing that uh, women who have their first uh, babies later in their life, they tend to have uh, uh, smaller motherhood penalties. And so uh, the question arises, uh, what about the timing of, uh, of fatherhood? Uh, may also timing of fatherhood have some effects on wage? And uh, so, yeah, the question is, 
whether men who become fathers earlier in their career, uh, excuse me, earn higher, wa earn uh, different wages than men who enter fatherhood later, and whether the results are stable across societies which differ in their socioeconomic setting. And in order to research this question, uh, I selected uh, West Germany and the United Kingdom. Uh, the reason is uh, why I chose particularly these countries is that they differ significantly in their welfare state regimes. So for example, Germany is uh, typically characterized as a coordinated market economy with a very strong male as the main uh, family breadwinner legacy. And also it is characterized by uh, a coordinated labor market, by uh, very secure uh, wages and uh, uh, work trajectories, whereas the United Kingdom tends to be rather uh, opposite to, the, uh, to Germany. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, usually is characterized as the liberal market economy with um, a very flexible labor market, with high competitiveness in the labor market, and uh, uh, high integration of uh, women in the labor market and uh, which results in, let's say, two earners family as a norm because both, uh, both partners uh, in a couple need to work in order to provide for the family. And so it would be interesting to see if, uh, if uh, fatherhood timing may differ, uh, may result in, in different wage outcomes. And so what explains uh, fatherhood premium? Uh, prior research has uh, uh, documented that um, uh, 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 individuals in a couple tend to uh, specialize in their comparative advantage when they become parents. Uh, for example, women typically be, uh, specialize in home production, uh, give, uh, given her breastfeeding ability and the um, gender wage inequalities in the labor market, which disadvantage and disincentivize uh, female labor participation. Uh, so as a result, uh, women during the early child uh, care period uh, tend to withdraw from the labor market and uh, start to concentrate on uh, caring for the family. Meanwhile, ma men become the fam main family breadwinners and, uh, and uh, this leads to their potential change in work effort. They may start working uh, harder or, or um, add more working hours, which in, uh, as a result uh, uh, um, leads to higher wages. And also the existence of um, uh, discri uh, discrimination may be, may be present. Uh, employers tend to favor uh, men with children because they are perceived as more um, responsible, uh, more uh, um, loyal, because they have to provide for the family. And so uh, usually when it comes to deciding who will get a promotion, those tend to be men with children. And um, uh, besides these explanations of uh, fatherhood premium, there is this another dimension, which I already uh, mentioned, the timing, uh, the timing perspective. And if we look at uh, the timing aspect from the life course theory, um, it states that um, mm, different, um, uh, different timing of events uh, have different consequences for the subsequent life. And uh, in this regard, for example, prior research has shown that uh, men um, with higher education tend to become fathers later. And usually those are highly educated fathers who receive the highest fatherhood uh, premium. And uh, uh, also, uh, another mechanism is that uh, the so-called balancing role, uh, early fathers may experience disrupted uh, schooling, because if they become fathers early, they may uh, be obliged to drop out of the labor market in order to, uh, to drop out of the school in order to step into the labor market and to provide for the family. So as a result, they do not get the best education which they could have uh, gotten. And it translates in lower wage, whereas fathers who postpone uh, fatherhood to a later stage when they have already acquired education and uh, if they postpone even further on, they can establish themselves at work and um, 
get into career uh, tracks which promise uh, higher uh, higher uh, wage returns and this could be one mechanism at the same time uh, mm, uh, there exists a mentor's uh, earnings function. Uh, and so the idea is that if, if uh, men uh, become fathers at the early career stage, um, when the wage is um, on an upward trend, um, so according to the mentor's earnings function, in general, wage has a concave pattern. It tends to increase at the early career, then it flattens out by the mid-career, and then uh, closer to the retirement, it slowly uh, decreases. And uh, so if, father if a man becomes father in the early career stage, when the wage is increasing, uh, this wage increase following fatherhood may be misleadingly attributed to fatherhood alone, although it might not be the case. At the same time, also, it could be a different mechanism of uh, men who become fathers at earlier career stage, according to this mentor's earnings function and life course theory, um, they may uh, damage their future career because if in the early uh, career, is the time when you are establishing yourself at work. And uh, like it is not uh, ideal to have uh, bulging guys at this period because of the lack of sleep, uh, just when the big promotions loop, uh, loom, especially if you, if you compete with men uh, who do not have uh, children and who do not have uh, to change nappies uh, during during night. And so if these men at early career miss out those potential uh, work promotions, they are again missing out on their potentially higher wages. So what I what overall what I would predict is that men who become fathers at earlier career have in, uh, in general, uh, on average lower wages than those who postpone fatherhood. And uh, uh, in order to do that, I apply a longitudinal panel data and I use fixed effect model. And uh, my outcome variable is um, the log of the real gross hourly wages. And then the main independent variables are first, the number of children at uh, each survey year. And um, Another independent variable is the uh, time constant indicator, which comprises uh, the accumulated work experience at the point of the first childbirth and then their interaction. Uh, and this uh, model specification helps me um, estimate what is the uh, wage effect of each additional child and how this wage effect differs between men who enter the fatherhood at different stages in their career. And according to my results, uh, uh, it shows that uh, there is uh, a statistically significant and negative relationship between early fatherhood, because here we can see in both countries, fathers who become, uh, men who become fathers earlier uh, tend to receive lower wages and uh, Eat, uh, with every additional year of postponement, a wage tends to be higher. However, in this first model specification, uh, I, am, I am able only calculate the first fatherhood entry timing, and um, I'm not uh, accounting for the timing of subsequent uh, children. And in order to do that, I added additional model specification. Uh, due to the limited time, I'm unfortunately not able to go more into detail, but uh, results uh, are in line with the previous trend uh, showing that um, um, earlier in the career, um, the, um, the, the wage tends to be lower, but then with each additional child and with each additional work experience, uh, wage is getting higher. And uh, when we graph this relationship visually, so what we can see here is actually um, uh, so that uh, every, um, so every additional year of experience uh, among uh, men with kids uh, tend to result in uh, in a higher in a higher wage, and uh, here we see that also there are some slight differences between the United Kingdom and uh, Germany, where uh, German men uh, tend to have 
higher returns per each child and uh, work experience than men in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, I believe uh, here my time ends, uh, 12 minutes have exceeded. And uh, if you have questions, I will be, I will be glad to uh, provide you with more specific details. Thank you.